Premature ovarian failure is another name for early menopause. The average age of menopause is around 51, but menopause is not technically considered abnormal unless it occurs before age 40. As in menopause, the gonadotropins, LH and FSH, are elevated in premature ovarian failure, but the ovaries do not respond and therefore estrogen levels are low. Remember hypogonadotropic hypogonadism that we talked about before? Well, in contrast, premature ovarian failure is also called hypergonadotropic hypogonadism because you have the anterior pituitary signaling the ovaries with LH and FSH as hard as it can, but with no result. So how is premature ovarian failure a bad thing? Well, along with infertility, early menopause also puts women at increased risk for osteoporosis and heart disease, since as you know, estrogen is normally protective against these diseases. The condition is most often idiopathic, but in some cases it can be caused by autoimmune disorders. On the boards, anovulation may show up as part of an infertility case scenario, so you want to keep the most common causes of anovulation in mind. These include polycystic ovarian syndrome, obesity, Asherman syndrome, when the regenerating layer of the endometrium gets scraped off, generally mechanically, and adhesions are formed, endocrine abnormalities of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, premature ovary failure, prolactinomas, hyper or hypothyroidism, eating disorders, Cushing syndrome, and adrenal insufficiency. The next topic is very high yield for the boards, frequently showing up in many different ways. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is an endocrine disorder in which LH levels are much, much higher than FSH levels. A ratio of greater than 3 to 1 is considered diagnostic. It is associated with insulin resistance, and it's thought to be due to high insulin levels causing an increase in GnRH pulse frequency, which in turn causes more LH than FSH to be produced. As you can see from the image here, you get a thickened ovarian capsule and numerous small subcortical cysts. You might want to try to commit this picture to memory, as it's a pretty classic finding in the setting of this disease, and obviously step one loves classic findings. The next image shows the sonographic findings of PCOS. Here you can see the hyperechoic cystic spaces. So what causes the cysts in polycystic ovarian syndrome? The cysts occur because the hormone that maintains the follicles, FSH, is low. Therefore, the follicles degenerate, leaving you with just cystic spaces. In terms of phenotype, PCOS is characterized by anovulation, amenorrhea, infertility, obesity, and hirsutism, where you get hair in masculine areas, such as the chest, face, and trunk. It's also associated with endometrial cancer. This is related to increased peripheral conversion of elevated androgens to estrogens in the increased number of fat cells. The treatment for PCOS includes weight loss, oral contraceptives, gonadotropin analogs, clomiphene, spironolactone, or surgery. We'll discuss the drugs more in the farm section, but remember that oral contraceptives inhibit the HPO axis and decrease FSH and LH levels, so they're often given to polycystic ovarian syndrome patients. Clomiphene works by increasing estrogen, and spironolactone blocks the androgen receptor, making it an effective adjunct to OCP therapy. Staying on the subject of ovaries, this fact summarizes the different types of ovarian cysts. Most of these cysts are harmless, but they can cause problems such as rupturing, bleeding, or pain so occasionally these cysts do have to be surgically removed. Follicular cysts are swollen, unruptured graphene follicles. They're associated with high estrogen states, like endometrial hyperplasia. If they rupture during the middle of the menstrual cycle, they can cause pain. What's that called? Mittelschmerz, as we discussed in the reprophysiology talk. Corpus luteum cysts occur when there is hemorrhage into a persistent corpus luteum, which is formed after an egg has been released from a follicle. Remember that this is the part of the ovary that secretes progesterone. Thecal lutein cysts are also called functional cysts, and they occur in the setting of high gonadotropins with ovulation. They're often bilateral, and they can occur and can be associated with choriocarcinomas and moles. Hemorrhagic cysts occur when a blood vessel ruptures, leading to retention of blood. These usually self-resolve and are of little concern. Dermoid cysts actually represent one type of mature teratoma, a name for a type of neoplasm that contains tissues derived from multiple germ layers and comes from the Greek word teras, which means monster. Since they're derived from multiple germ layers, they can contain many different types of mature tissue, but more on that in a little bit. Pretty monstrous, huh? Chocolate cysts, also known as endometrioid cysts, are the blood-filled cysts in ovarian endometriosis. They get larger during menses due to cyclic bleeding. So again, here's that example of a chocolate cyst from a few moments ago. Let's switch to ovarian germ cell tumors, which is a pretty meaty topic. To give you a little bit of context, ovarian cancers can be divided into three main classes epithelial, stromal, and germ cell tumors. Many of them have characteristic changes in circulating hormone levels. Memorize these as they tend to be the fastest and easiest ways to ID the tumor you're given in a question stem. 
While the most common type, epithelial, occurs mostly in postmenopausal women, the germ cell tumors occur mostly in younger women and adolescents. The germ cell tumors you're likely to see on the boards are dysgerminomas, choriocarcinomas, yolk sac tumors, and teratomas. Dysgerminomas are equivalent to male seminomas, which we'll talk about later on. They're characterized by elevated HCG, as well as elevated lactate dehydrogenase. Choriocarcinomas are associated with pregnancy exposure, including moles, ectopics, and miscarriages. You'll also see them with thecalutein cysts. The cells are large, hyperchromatic, syncytiotrophoblasts, which, if you'll remember from the embryology section, are the large, multinucleated cells found in the embryo's placenta that make up the outer layer of the chorionic villi. And guess what that makes? It secretes HCG, which helps make the diagnosis. Yolk sac, or endodermal sinus tumors, are aggressive tumors typically found in children under age 3. As scary as this is, they respond very well to chemo, so these days kids don't die from this condition if it's treated in time. You can also get a yolk sac tumor in an adult, but typically this occurs with another germ cell tumor like a teratoma. Yolk sac tumors are characterized as yellow, friable, solid masses with Schiller Duval bodies. Schiller Duval bodies look like mini glomeruli and are basically pathognomonic for this condition, so keep that description in mind. In terms of making the diagnosis, an elevated alpha fetoprotein level is normally diagnostic. Teratomas, which we briefly mentioned before, make up 90% of ovarian germ cell tumors and characteristically have two or three different germ cell layers. Mature teratomas are also called dermoid cysts, as we said, and here we have an example of one that has ectodermal features, including hair. This one was also found of neuroglia. Here's another teratoma that you see in the book. It has teeth and hair structures. This picture of mixed histology is the hallmark of the disease with simultaneous appearance of many diverse types of tissue, such as respiratory, skin, and nervous tissue. While mature teratomas, a.k.a. dermoid cysts, are benign, immature teratomas tend to be much more aggressive and malignant, and like most tumors, the less differentiated, the more aggressive. One notable type of mature teratoma that is sometimes separately tested is struma ovarii, which means goiter of the ovary. It's usually benign, but can occasionally be malignant. Interestingly, they can occasionally secrete thyroid hormone, creating a clinical picture of hyperthyroidism. Let's switch to ovarian non-germ cell tumors. Here we're going to focus mainly on epithelial tumors, which include serous, mucinous, and Brenner tumors. When you think of ovarian cancer, you usually think of cancer marker CA125. Remember that this marker is generally not specific or sensitive, so it's not that useful for making the diagnosis, but it's useful for following response to treatment and to check for occurrence of cancer. In addition to BRCA1, I would also add BRCA2 to the list of genes where mutations can lead to ovarian cancer. Also, hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer is associated with ovarian cancer. But what gynecological cancer is even more common in women with HNPCC? That would be endometrial cancer, and women with HNPCC have an 80% prevalence of that cancer. The serous cyst adenomas make up 20% of ovarian tumors. They're often bilateral, and they tend to be lined with fallopian tube-like epithelium. The malignant form of the generally benign serous cystadenoma is the serous cystadenocarcinoma. They make up about half of all ovarian tumors. They're frequently bilateral. The mucinous cystadenoma is typically a multilocular cyst lined by mucus secreting epithelium. Its malignant form is the mucinous cystadenocarcinoma, characterized by intraperitoneal accumulation of mucinous material. This is referred to as pseudomyxoma peritonei. Brenner tumors are rare ovarian tumors that can mimic transitional epithelium of the bladder. They're usually benign and unilateral. On gross pathology, you'll see a solid, sharply circumscribed, yellow tan mass. On histology, you'll see a bunch of coffee bean nuclei. They're embedded in a fibrous stroma. So here are the coffee beans here, and you can see the stroma all around it. Fibromas are benign tumors characterized by bundles of spindle-shaped fibroblasts. One presentation of ovarian fibroma is referred to as Meg's syndrome. Meg's syndrome is the triad of ovarian fibroma, ascites, and hydrothorax. Typically, the hydrothorax, or pleural effusion, is on the right side, but nobody knows why. Granulosa cell tumors are found in the stroma of the ovary. The peak incidence is in patients in their 50s, and it often shows up as abnormal uterine bleeding. They can secrete estrogen and can be associated with early puberty, in addition to endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. On histology, you'll see that granulosa cells have call exner bodies, which are these small follicles filled with eosinophilic secretions. These are pathognomonic for granulosa cell tumors, so make sure you commit them to memory. I like to remember it by recalling the need to call my gran-e, so I know that call exner bodies are associated with granulosa cell tumors. Krukenberg tumors are GI tumors, usually an adenocarcinoma, that metastasize to the ovaries. They're characterized by mucin-secreting signet cells. 
As you can see in the image, the cell has a nucleus pushed to the edge, here and here, making the cell look like a signet ring, which was the type of ring they used to imprint wax on an envelope with a symbol back in the old days. Moving on to the vagina, the most common vaginal carcinomas are the squamous cell carcinomas associated with HPV infection and cervical SCC. Clear cell carcinomas of the vagina are found in women who are exposed to diethylstilbestrol, or DES, while in utero. So why is it called clear cell? Well, the cells become vacuolated and filled with glycogen, so on microscopy they have a clear appearance. DES used to be given to decrease miscarriages, and ironically was thought to be safe during pregnancy, but it was later found to be associated with causing fetal structural abnormalities in the uterus and cervix, as well as with clear cell adenocarcinomas. Lastly, sarcoma botryoides is a version of rhabdomyosarcoma that affects girls less than four years old. The name means grape bunches, based on its gross appearance. On histology, the cells are spindle-shaped, as well as positive for desmin, a marker for skeletal muscle.